my Papa Charlie pose. Uh-huh. Or you think, uh, dad. Uh-huh. He do Well, hey, everybody, we apologize, first of all, for the delay. Had a little bit of technical difficulty, but those things are solved, and we're here, ready to go. Welcome to the Takeover Live, Revelations for Real Life. I'm telling you, we got a show for you today that will bless you. It's going to really be one you're going to want to share with anybody and everybody that you can, because you you never know who this is going to bless from Flint all the way around the world. And we told you that with this show, we're going to be bringing things that we can use in our regular everyday life. So we are going to be talking about something that affects a lot of people, particularly in this day and age. But we're not going to tell you exactly what it is just yet. Y'all know this is our normal Friday night service, so we'll be given an opportunity to sow into this good ground later on in the service. But understand that your giving really helps us provide this type of content, and really keep this message going for everybody across the world. Now, as, as per usual, we have some special guests with us today, but I want to remind everybody it is Pastor's Appreciation Month, and we have planned to go with Pastor every week this month, but y'all know how Pastor is. He get a call and he got to do something else that the Spirit tells him to do, and his willingness to do that is, is really why we appreciate him. So... Um, they're telling me they can't hear me, Drew. On a personal note, I remember one thing about Pastor I wanted to share. One thing, when my mom was in the hospital, she was dealing with open heart surgery. And Pastor and Lady Fran were in Midland at a conference. And they drove all the way back just to pray with my mom before her surgery. And I'll never forget that. It, it gave us some peace of mind, some some easement for the situation that was at hand. And uh, man, we just, we thank him for it all the time. So you just don't find many pastors or people in general out there with that type of compassion and love. But that said, we have a topic today that we just don't talk about enough in the church or in the kingdom for that matter. And we're going to end that today. So before we meet our guests and before we get into our topic, we have some people that want to just share a few reasons why they appreciate Pastor Brown. So, Pastor, this is for you. The knowledge and insight that is necessary for us to be the where we are right now as far as in our spiritual walk with God. We thank you for always being there for us whenever we uh, reached out to you. And uh, we're just happy to serve you and to be a part of KHM. And once again, we just thank you on behalf of the Miles family. We greatly appreciate you and happy Pastor Appreciation Month. Love you. One of the biggest things that I really appreciate about Dr. Brown, he's always telling us to seek wisdom and knowledge. Uh, not just seek one, but seek the other. Uh, Lady Friend, I know, speaks a lot about it, too. But, yeah, it's, it definitely resonates with me, especially for what I do. So I appreciate you, we thank you, and we love you, Dr. Brown. Hey, Pastor. Just want to let you know how much we appreciate you and how much you have blessed me and my family. You know, you taught me how to have a successful marriage and how to raise godly children. Man, you really are an inspiration to us. Thank you for all that you do. Love you, Pastor. I have the absolute best grace gift ever, bar none. 
I joined the ministry as a college student and Pastor Brown has been there to help me through some real challenges in life, like the loss of my daughter, challenges on the job, divorce, financial struggles, you name it. I've been able to walk away successful because of his teachings of godly principles and the supernatural effect of eternal words. Thank you, Pastor, for being the best grace gift ever. Pastor Brown, there are so many things that I appreciate you for, and one of them is that you have taught us, despite our past, in Christ Jesus, we can help God expand his kingdom and live a kingdom lifestyle. For that, I am eternally grateful, and so is Aaron. We love you and appreciate you. Uh, yeah, I, trust you. me, I can, I can hear it. I can hear it loud and clear. It's as simple as the ABCs. He's anointed, blessed. Yeah, ladies, Christ just talk God. about... She divine. joined the church when she was a college student. He expressed <laughs> faithful <laughs> giving. He's heavenly minded, inspirational, joyful, kind, and loving. He's a minister with never failing obedience, with priceless qualities of righteous, spiritual, trusting, unique, vibrant wisdom. He's an X Factor. <laughs> with youth, youthful zeal. That's our pastor. And with someone with all those qualities, how can you not appreciate them? All right, as you can see, we're still working through a few technical difficulties, but I think we got it now. So you heard just a number, a few people really given an opportunity to express their gratitude and appreciation for Pastor Brown. So as you can see, sir, there are a variety of reasons that we appreciate you and we honor you this month, but well beyond that, not just in this month. But without further ado, I want to introduce the guest for this evening. We have with us my brother, DeMonte Scott, and his mom, our friend, our finance, financial expert, we got <laughs> Mrs. Gail Bowman Cuba. Yes. Welcome, welcome. We appreciate you coming. I know um, this is uh, new for y'all. Y'all on the, in the pulpit now, so. Yeah. 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 So uh, I just want to, I want to start by saying that I heard you giving your testimony to Monte Sunday. Uh -huh. And when, when you were talking, when, by the time you got done, I actually filmed some of it. But by the time you got done, I walked over to the piano and I told Justice, I said, that's our guy. That's the one we've been looking for. For two plus years, we've been looking for somebody to cover this topic um, that not only can talk about it, but also have, can talk about it from an experience standpoint. And, and so I, I was excited. So I, I immediately was like, oh, Tamiko, what's Gail number? I, I need to text her. I need to, we need to set this up. We need to get going. Um, and so here we are. We set it up. Mm -hmm. You agreed. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. And we, we I, first of all, let me tell everybody, we could talk about this for hours, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> right, we're not right. going to do that. Right. Um, we're going to try to narrow it down and really deal with specific, you know, uh, hit the highlights. But I wanted you to have more time to really express your, yourself because I know just giving a testimony, you, you got a lot of things running through your mind trying yeah. to get it all out. Yeah. Um, but let's start right. I want to start right at the the retinitis pigmentosa. I want to start right there. And I know it's something that we probably haven't heard of, yeah. uh, many of us, but I, I, I did some research. Uh, okay, okay. It's a, it's a rare, it's rare. Uh -huh. um, it's less than, fewer than 200,000 cases a year in the medical, in the world, in the medical field, that's rare. Uh -huh. um, and it's also to b believed to be a, a degenerative uh, condition that, that you're born with. It's nothing that you did or nothing no. that you could have controlled at all. Mm -hmm. um, so you told us you had, and I was like, my first thing was like, okay, what's that? Because I'm, <laughs> right, I'm a research right. guy, so I'm like, yeah, right. I gotta figure out what this is. Mm -hmm. But you talked about, I wanna, I wanna, because you talked about one of the things they offered you at the time, I believe it was a, <laughs> it was a basically an implant with yeah. a camera, right? Uh -huh. And, and, and uh, yes, sir. How, how does, how was that gonna work? Well, okay. <laughs> It wasn't. It was not going to work. But <laughs> besides the fact that it wasn't going to work, um, retinitis pigmentosa affects the rods and the cones in your eyes. 
And your rods, I do believe, help you see in light and dark, and your cut and the cones help you see in color. Mm -hmm. And so it begins to, uh, you lose your peripheral vision first. And you always think peripheral vision is sideways, but peripheral vision is up and down also. Mm. The normal eye looking straight can see in 360 degrees. Well, my right eye can see in 40 degrees, and my left, my left eye can see in 20 degrees. Okay. Right. So instead of 360, it's just 20 degrees. You lose your central vision first. So it's, I can see kind of the outside of things, but not the, not di directly. Hmm. Now, wow. Yeah. So 85 percent of our communication is nonverbal. Right. So you lose all of that. You, you lose when people smile and then people I, facial gestures and so you lose all of those, all of those things. Now, so when they diagnosed me and they told me about this, <clears throat> he come in and he said, I got bad news. Okay. He said, if you were 70 or 80 years old, I'd be like, okay. He said, but you're 32. This was 10 years ago, February, 10 years ago, uh, 2013. And so he began to describe what the rods and the cones and all of that do. And then after that, I kind of went blank and he kind of sounded like Charlie Brown teacher. It was like, wah, 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 a lot of that. And then he came back to, well, we have some cutting edge technology. And then that's when he offered to, as a camera that they plant in the back of your eye, and then they give you a battery pack that you're supposed to carry around. Well, the, the way my coordination is set up, or lack thereof, um, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm terribly clumsy, so that was a no-go. You and that camera wasn't going to get along. No, 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 it was, no. So, so when you receive news like that, mm -hmm. um, because most of us can only imagine receiving news like that, right? It's mm. something that we, we've never experienced, but, but we, we certainly have family and friends that have gotten uh, news of uh, degenerative illnesses. But when you get that, I know, it, I know it can potentially cause mental anguish, even, you know, as well as the physical thing that you're dealing with, right? It's a, uh. it's a mindset. And I, I looked at a poll, um, the Harris poll for 2022 said that now 67% of people are saying they have experienced a mental health issue in their lives. So if that wasn't bad enough, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. A couple yeah. weeks later, uh -huh. something else happened, right? You got, you got misdiagnosed and, and then the real diagnosis came. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm waiting to get my glasses, okay? And in the process of waiting to get my glasses, I had these sharp pains in my chest. So I go to a clinic and they tell me I have walking pneumonia. When I get there, let me tell you, I had no symptoms. I had no cough, no sneeze, no fever, no nothing. I just told them it felt like it's knives stuck in my chest. So they give me an x-ray and they talk about the x-ray and they show me all these different spots I got and I say, okay. So they say you have walking pneumonia. Take these antibiotics for seven days. Okay. Take these antibiotics for seven days. On day eight, I can't get off the couch where I was sleeping. So I called my mother, um, you know, talk to my phone. See, hey Siri is a beautiful invention for those of us. <laughs> hey Siri is wonderful for all of those who are visually impaired. Oh, and by the way, I'm not disabled. I'm differently able. But we'll get to that later. Okay. Um, we'll get to that later. And so I get to the hospital and I tell them the same thing. I said, well, I have walking pneumonia and I have no, you know, I have no temperature, no, same, no symptoms. So then they asked me, have I been out of, over uh, to another country and they think I have an atypical pneumonia and they give me a CAT scan and all these different things. And so probably by day two, day three, while I'm in there, um, a pulmonary specialist comes in and he said, we're going to give you a lung biopsy because we think you have uh, this thing called sarcoidosis. Now, now, when I was young, three or four, they diagnosed me with asthma. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I had asthma. I said, no, I got asthma. I don't have sarcoidosis. Hmm. He said, well, okay, well, they, they kind of thought asthma and sarcoidosis, you know, they didn't know nothing about sarcoidosis. So they give me a lung biopsy and he comes back and, oh, before I did the lung biopsy, I had to take a breathing test and uh, my lung capacity was 41%. So they like, they asked me how long had I been like that and I said, I don't, a couple of weeks. So I'm like, this, how are you walking around with 41% lung capacity? Anyway. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, 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 wait a yeah, second. Yeah, I kind of blew up. 40% <laughs> vision in the right eye, 20% in the left, and 41% lung capacity. Yeah, yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. So all together, you had 100%. But, but, <laughs> but, but separately, I, I, I'm laughing, y'all, because he told us it was okay. Oh, yeah, feel he free to laugh. He told us it was okay, so I don't want nobody to think I'm being insensitive. That's how I get through it. But go ahead, go ahead. So so you got the second diagnosis, and, uh -huh. and, and how would you say it, it hit you coming on the heels of the first diagnosis that, that, that short of time? I couldn't move, man. It was... It was it's a numbing thing because I was still processing the fact that, <laughs> that I couldn't see. Because when they tell you that you're going blind or whatever it is, you don't, man, don't, it don't quite sink in then. It don't really sink in then. And so when they tell you you have sarcoidosis, I've been sick off and on my whole life. So sarcoidosis really, it was just like, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be sick, right? I could deal with that. The vision thing, that's an everyday thing. That's an everyday, all day. You have different days. See, I didn't know. They said you go through a transition, so I have blurry days, and I have days where I see not doubles, but one and a half, and then your depth perception is off, and so you reach for something, and it's not there, but you see it. And so it's all of those things. Those, I, being sick is, I've been sick my whole life, so I'm kind of used to that, believe it or not. It's, you know, uh, but when you tell, when your mind is told something, your body reacts, and, and it's no stopping that. So I actually stopped reading because I thought I couldn't read. That's what I, I was going to ask you about that because you told me that in our conversation. I was like, wow, I never, it never dawned on me that 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 physical diagnosis could mentally change your the, the thought process. You've been reading, so you know you can read. I know I can read. I stopped writing because I thought I couldn't write no more. Cause I couldn't see, right? right. But, that, but, that's, but that shows us how important this, the mental side of it is and, and why we have to do, why the Bible tells us to think on certain things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we don't think on those things, mm -hmm. our, our minds are powerful. We, our minds were created to be, we, you know, they say we're only using... 10% of our brains, but man, I mean, it's, it's just the, our minds are so vast, and so like you said, when you if you tell yourself something, oh, you you will manifest it. You, you will manifest it. This is, this is true. And I just started wearing glasses, these sunglasses. Uh, actually, the first pair I got was in July for my mother's wedding. Um, <clears throat> Let me tell you how I got diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. I had uh, a night out with some friends, so say it like that, right? This is during my dark days. So I had, some, I had a night out with some friends, and I just lost my glasses. This is just, that was just it. If, it, if I've never lost my glasses, and even when I lost my glasses, I said, well, I mean, my glasses don't really help me that much anyway. Mm. And I, I was getting ready to go see my son. His birthday is in April. And so I know I needed to get some glasses because, uh, you know, my mother don't like me traveling without no glasses, you know, to make her feel safe. And so um, if it wasn't for that, I, I never would have went and got my eyes checked, ever. So, and, wow. and so then I ended up losing my glasses again last summer, and she bought me a pair of sunglasses, and it changed my life. Mm. Completely. We, we definitely going to get to how that changed your okay. life, because I, I, that's interesting to me. Yeah. But uh, Mom, I'm, I'm just curious, at this point, you aware of these two diagnoses, what, what's going on as in, through a mother's mind? Yeah, what, why? Huh. Why, and is it any possible way that can, that can change? Mm. Yeah, because he had some dark days, very dark days. And he would call me, and he'd be going off, and he'd be fussing, and he'd be just losing it. And I put the phone up like this, and I'd be like, Father God, and all my <laughs> Jesus, touch me right now, Lord God, touch me. You know, because... That's the only person that my, at that point in, in my mind that was going to be able to help him. So you felt like really nothing you could do in and of yourself. Absolutely. You needed God to, to, to touch him. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Man, that's, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have children, but I can only imagine that feeling yeah. of not being able to help helpless. your children. Just totally, just totally helpless. Mm. Yeah. So when I thought about, when I, when I had to count, when we talked yesterday, Demonte, mm -hmm. I thought about Job. Mm -hmm. I went, my mind went to Job, and I was like, because the situation with Job, obviously we know a lot of things were taken from him, including, including some of his physical uh, attributes, I mean, to the point where he was scraping sores off his body as a, as, a, as a habit, right? Because he was, 
and I, and I, you look at some of the, the scriptures in Job, mm -hmm. and uh, it brought me to Dr. Brown's across the, his principle about depression. Mm -hmm. So again, y'all, we gonna we we gotta focus on the test in order to get to the testimony. So we're not mm -hmm. glorifying this the negative, but we we have to talk about it in order to get to the testimony. So I just want to, Dr. Brown's dark depression, in words in different light, it says dark depression is the declining and enervating pressure of rejection, emptiness, sadness, sorrow, and ineffectiveness obstructing and negating success. Wow. Dark depression is a result of the devastating emotional deficit stripping you of the desire to continue a course of action that promotes the expansion and advancement of the kingdom of God and for enjoying the, for the experience and enjoyment of a kingdom lifestyle. And then he said he's got three laws. You get, first, it's a downturn, and then it's a dejection, and then it's despair. And I said, wow. Hmm. So, I'm, so having heard that, having heard me just read that, hmm. Hmm. And, and thinking about <laughs> yeah. your situation, yeah. tell me, how you, can you see that as part of what you were going through at that time? All of it. Every, hmm. single, every single word of it. Um, I used to... Uh, I sit alone in, in my house in the living room, and uh, I had a speaker. And so on Sundays, I would listen to church in the morning. And it says three phases of life. You're either going into a storm, you're in a storm, or you exit in a storm. Well, I just felt like my storm was just never going to end. And, and it's, it's phases to it. Like, depression is a, you don't know when it happens. You, 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 don't, you don't know because you still look the same. Right, mm -hmm. like so to everybody else, I look the same. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's like Superman, and he got his cape on and everything. And you're waiting for him to fly, but he's not gonna fly. <laughs> right? Like who wants to see Superman without? They can't fly. But that's how I felt. And then it, it spirals, and it gets worse, and it and it gets worse. And, and and all you all you hear is all you hear is the bad news. Mm -hmm. You could tell me the best news in the world, but I will find something in your statement that I needed. To feel bad because misery needs company, right? And they vacation in the state of depression. By the way, this is very true. This is hey, very. When I heard you say that, I, <laughs> I took true. note of that statement just <laughs> okay. so you know, because okay. I was like, "Boy, he put that. He laid that down right there. That was a word." And I got beachfront. You have beachfront real, real estate, right? Uh -huh. Right there. And a couple of Airbnbs for my company. Okay. Okay. Now, it's, on that note, <laughs> we we go pause right quick because okay. we because we uh okay we wanna we wanna get a little further in the story, but before we do, mm -hmm. Pastor, we got some more video for you. People that want to just, just tell you how much they love you. But wait, that's not all. Stay tuned for more. So we were asked to give our two top reasons as to why uh, Pastor Brown is the best. And what I can say is he's the best uncle a girl could ever ask for. Um, but also, there has never been a time that we've reached out to him and he's not shown up, whether it be pastor, whether it be uncle, brother. Anytime we need Pastor Brown, he is there for us. And we can't say thank you and show you how much we appreciate and love you very, very much. Reasons I appreciate you, Pastor Brown. One, I know you're a man of integrity. And two, I know in any family emergency, you're going to be there for any of us. Or if you can't be there, you're going to call or send an elder. And from personal experiences, I truly thank you and appreciate you for being there for me um, in times of need. Love you, Pastor Brown. Pastor Brown, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for saying yes. I appreciate you for accepting the call that God has on your life. Thank you. Thank you for your love, your support, your encouragement, your prayer, your time, your talent, and your treasure. Thank you for believing in me. The world has never been the same since you said yes. Thank you, Pastor. I love you more than you'll ever know. I appreciate you. I appreciate Pastor Brown for his selflessness. I know he goes above and beyond for Kaysom every single day, inside and outside of the kingdom. Um, I can personally think of a few moments where he has been there for me when I really needed him the most. And I can tell you it wasn't on a Sunday or a Wednesday. And I can only imagine how many other people he has been there for, 
when they really needed him. What I appreciate most about Pastor Brown is this commitment to the process of hearing from God on our behalf. I'm talking about those countless mornings where he had to get up early in the morning to hear from God and those times where he stayed in the house until noon or later because God wasn't finished speaking to him. And it just becomes evident when he stands in the pulpit and opens his mouth and decrees and declares what it is that God said. I tell you what, my life has been changed. I know many people's lives have been changed because of that commitment to the process. Whatever it took, he did it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We thank you, um, yes. man, for everything, Pastor. I, I don't even know how to say it. I, I kind of limited people in their videos to 30 seconds. They were kind of upset with me because they had so much to say. <laughs> but thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. And uh, you've been teaching us about the power of, the eternal power of words. Yes. And, and so as we were talking, and, and I was thinking about that when we, you know, the words that we say about our physical condition can affect our mental condition. And then I, this, this next segment, I, I wanted, I, I called it, and I normally don't even talk about which segment is what, but I, I called it Angels of Mine. Mm. Because you talk, you talk to me about certain people that came across your path. Yes. That couldn't have been a coincidence. Yes. Couldn't have been just happenstance. Right. Uh, Pastor Brown is certainly one of them. But before that, uh, I'll tell you my, my brief experience I just had. Um, the other night, a couple of nights ago, uh, somebody, one of our, our sisters in Christ came up to me and she just told me, she literally crying and told me how much she appreciated me just being her brother, hmm. just being, being able to laugh and joke because she didn't have brothers. Hmm. And I said, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, you never, you don't think about yeah. the impact that you can have on people just by being the, 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 the type of person you're supposed to be. Yeah. We suppose we call ourselves brothers and sisters, but do we actually treat each other like brothers and sisters? And so when that, that just affirmed in me when she said that. And I was like, wow, OK, mm -hmm. that lets me know. I, it lets me even further know I need to make sure that when I'm interacting and, and my relationship with people is where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and you said something to me along those same lines that hit homes. You said that people were checking on you, but not checking in. <laughs> With you. Yeah. yeah. What does yeah. that what does that mean? Explain that. Well, <clears throat> people will call me and ask that, um well, well first they'll say, Well, I was just calling to check on you. Have you ate? Have you okay, well those are the checking on when someone checks on you, they're doing that more so for their own good. So they can sleep good at night. Well mm. I called and checked on them, but they don't check in with you. Mm. You know how you can be with somebody but not with them? You can sit right next to somebody but not be with them. Mm -hmm. Right. You could be amongst people and be alone. So I always feel alone. So I need to be checked in on. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, yeah, OK, I ate some food, but that doesn't when you check in on me, that means you, you want to know what's going on with me mm -hmm. on the inside, on the inside of me. Right. Not physically, I'm OK. You know, yeah, well, I ate and I'm, and I'm OK. I got somewhere to stay. And, you know, but have you checked in with me? Do you know what my mind state is today? Mm -hmm. Because it varies. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you, now you would think that you would be able to tell from somebody's tone of voice, or, but most people don't pay that much attention to people. Mm, that was deep. When you said it to me, I was like, wow. I yeah. said, how many people have I just checked on? Checked yeah. on. Yeah, think about and it. I'm, and I was like, yeah, man, I'm, I, I, I know. You know, the pastor say you can't say man, you say ouch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just had to say <laughs> ouch. Like, man, yeah. Yeah. I got to check yeah. in with some yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. And not just, you know, hey, you all right, cool. You know, but really, hey, what's going on? Let's go get lunch. Let's uh, yeah, what worked for you today? What didn't work for you today? Yeah, let's kick back and let's just let's just chop it up. Yeah, what was your highlight of the day? What was your low light? You, you know, do, do you need support or something? No, nobody ever, nobody offered me that. Yeah, right? I, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm telling you, you shared a word with me, didn't even know it. I'm like, man, he just hit me, <laughs> hit me over the head with that word. But let's talk about a few angels in your life. I want to start. I call him Big G. Okay, I call him BG. Okay, you I know him that's the, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I I had no idea of this connection by the way before you told me. Uh -huh. So tell me about your interaction with Big G and how you met him and what you know. Just tell me, tell the people how that interaction went down. Okay, well, um, here in the kingdom we refer to him as Elder Greg, uh, Greg Clemens. Well, when I was introduced to him at Flint Genesee Job Corps, he was uh, Clemens. We all call each other by our names. <clears throat> now speaking of light and dark, <clears throat> where I got trained was the first floor. They keep all the lights off on the first floor. It's dark. And we used to watch Clemens walk up the steps. 
And they used to say, you don't want to go up there with Clemens, man. You don't want to go up there with Clemens. Every time I seen him, he had a nice suit on, and he waved, and he just kept moving. And we just went upstairs. And so it's four RAs to the dorm, supposed to be two on each floor. But I was the new guy. So I stayed out in there with them. So one day my boss called me, told me to go upstairs with Clemens. And everybody started laughing at me. Yeah, you got to go up there with Clemens. And I'm like, okay, I'll go up here with Clemens. So I'm thinking I'm going to go up here with Clemens, and it's going to be, you know, whatever. So I get up there. And it's quiet. All the lights are on. First of all, I noticed all the lights are on up there. And it's quiet. It's not chaotic like downstairs. Downstairs is chaotic. It's kids yelling. It's cursing. You know, it's all kind of things. Upstairs, it's quiet. Real, real peaceful. Go up there and sit in the office with him. And, you know, he got a stature about himself, you know. But he's a gentle giant, you know, but he's got a stature about himself. So I sat down and we get to talking. And I said, hey, Clemens, I, I like it up here. And he looked up. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, it's the difference. I said, yeah. I said, well, I started telling him what they said downstairs, and he said, he didn't even respond. He, no response, no nothing. I said, hmm. <clears throat> and so I said, well, can I come back and work with you? He said, yeah. So as the time went on, we got to talking one day. He said, oh, Brother Scott, he said, do you go to church? I said, no, sir, no day to end and why. <laughs> he stopped eating, <laughs> he looked up at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's every day for those that went over there. That but. would be every day. Would, no day that ends in a while. would be Monday through Friday and including the holidays too, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so, and that was my story and I was sticking to it. And he said, boy, he said, you got a light. He said, you got a power. He said, when you ever walk into it, he said, you the man, Scott. He said, I just want to be able to say that I knew you before everybody else did. I said, oh. So wait a minute. This man that you hadn't Really interact with until no. you started going up there training and working with him. Right. Now he's everybody else kind of scared of him. No one will be up there. <laughs> but he he spoke some powerful eternal words into your life. He used to tell me every day, "Heavy is the head that wears the crown." Mm. He used to say, "For he who much is given, much is expected." Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm getting goosebumps right now. Um, I got some too. That's just wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was touching and. Um, and, and so my first day, uh, I had an interview and then go over to HR. And it's a little lady at the desk, and she's you got her nose buried, some paperwork. She said, come on in, Devontae. She didn't even look up, so I didn't even know how she knew my name. I, so I'm like, OK. So I come in, I'm like, hi, Miss Miles. And she said, how you doing, Devontae? I said, I'm blessed, not depressed. And she stopped writing. She looked up, and she smiled. She said, I like that. I said, well, you can only say it if you mean it. And every single time I saw her on campus, I don't care if I saw her two times, three times, I had to say, I'm blessed not to pray. <laughs> she said, how you doing? I said, I'm blessed not to pray. She said, okay, I can go now. So I've always had angels of the kingdom guiding me back here Man, with, this is without me even knowing it. Um, and we don't know. We don't know who we, no. we don't know who we entreat. That's what the Bible tells us. That's why we have to watch how we treat people. The Bible tells us you could be entreating angels unaware. Yeah. And, and, and not just angels from, from heaven, but we, we are angels on this earth. You know, I really believe that. And uh, with the Holy Spirit living inside of us in the kingdom, I mean, the Holy Spirit knows the word, right words to say to you um, that will get you to respond. It might not, you might not respond fully right at that moment. And that's why, you know, sometimes we plant the seed, mm -hmm. somebody else come by, they water that seed, and all of a sudden that seed grows. But let's, let me get into the nitty gritty here. Okay. Let me get into the nitty gritty here. Okay. Because you told me, mm -hmm. as you as your transition is what they call it, right, mm -hmm. into, yes, into your condition, mm -hmm. as it grew, that you started leaning on the bottle for support. Yes, sir. And that's and and um, yes, sir. You were were just tell me because. That's why I remembered when you said misery loves company and, you know, they vacation <laughs> together in the land of depression. Right, right. So how did that drinking affect that? How did that interact with that whole situation? And how, did, how, much, how big of a part of your life did that become? Oh, okay. Well, I stayed on Carpenter Road um, in between um, Clio and Fleming. So in between there, if I look out my window, I can see four churches. Four churches. I won't name the churches, but it's four churches. <laughs> and so I call it Salvation Street. Because <laughs> if you can't find nothing, you can find a house of the Lord somewhere. Mm -hmm. But what you can also find, if you keep going down the street, you can find a liquor store. Mm -hmm. So that's where I found my salvation at. I knew how many steps it took to get 
to the liquor store and back. Depending on the conditions and the state of inebriation, it varied. But I knew how many it took, <laughs> right? And so, um, how often did I do it? Well, the store opened at 8 o'clock. So if I left at 7.57, I'm on time. So 7.57, I'm out the door. If I'm not out at 7.57, I'm late. And then they close at 12 or 1 o'clock. And so I'm there too. Um, three times a day, definitely. And so it's, it's numbing, right? It's, 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 it's you leaning on that to escape yeah. mental and physical condition, right? And it's just like, hey, yeah. I know I can, I can take this alcohol in and, and get away. Yeah, because it's, it was my escapism. It was my medication. It's, if you're numb to it, then, you know, I got to go through it regardless, right? But if I'm numb to it or, or you know, it, it feels better. And misery needs company. You'll be surprised how many people will come over and will have a drink with you. So there you go. So it became a good way to have company. Hey, everybody come over and, and then they'll leave and they'll go on their way. And then I'll, and, and then I actually feel worse. When and leave, leave you right there in misery. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And see, that's, but, but through that, you, you, met a, you met an angel on that same street, though. Yes. Yes. I did meet an angel on that um, same street. Are you? Referring to the phone call I had? No, not the phone call, but the guy that, that uh, intercepted you when you went to the wrong house. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, one night. See, my mother don't know about this story. Oh, yeah. So we don't, we don't, we don't let stayed, her know. Right. Right. So I stay in between a dentist's office and a building. I'm glad you saw me. So one night I'm walking home, and again, I didn't wear glasses or anything. And I'm walking home, and I'm thinking I'm by my building. But I was by the dentist's office. So I started going left into the dentist's office, and a man stopped, and he said, excuse me, sir. He said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm just trying to get in my house. It's right here. And I was pointing. He said, no, that's, that's the dentist's office, sir. I said, oh. I said, oh, well, my house is right over here. He said, can I take you? And I said, yeah. And, then, and <clears throat> as I was approaching the, the car, he told me who he was. He was a deacon at some church. And so I said, okay. So I got in the car with him, and he said, I'll take you under one condition. I said, what? He said, you got to promise me you'll go to church with me tomorrow. I said, okay, okay. I'm saying anything to get out the car. Okay, yeah, I'll go to church. Sure, I'm going to go to church. <laughs> so he dropped me up. He dropped me off. I go out. He walked me up to the door, helped me open the door and everything. I said, okay, thank you. He said, I'll be here tomorrow. I said, okay, cool. I didn't, ever, didn't think twice about it. So I'm sitting there the next morning, and I hear a knock on the door. My first thought was it was Jehovah's Witness. Got to be honest with you. <laughs> so I run around to go see him. It wasn't that. It was him. I opened the door. He said, you ready to go to church? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you give me a second? So I'm going to brush my teeth and get ready, whatever. I go to the church, and the second I walk into church, people just start hugging me. Just hugging me and telling me how great it was for me to be there and loving on me and um. I sat next to him and we had a, you know, uh, a great message and he said, you going to come back? I said, yeah. I said, I'll be, I said, I'll be back. He, he said, um, you know, he spoke some powerful things to me. He, he let me go. He said, I'll be back. He came back next Sunday. Didn't answer. I was there. I didn't answer. Mm. I didn't answer. I wasn't ready. I felt, I felt like a fraud. Mm. Right? Right. So I, I, I couldn't go back. Oh, so you, you, you felt like because you didn't have yourself together that you couldn't be there and smile and, and kind of, I'm faking, right? Yeah. Because I'm not really together. No. That's what a lot of people um, have that mindset. And we, we as, as Christians, we got to remind people that God's still working on us, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. Don't, don't, don't think you got to get yourself all together before you come to God. He can, he can do that. When you get here, yeah, and and we got to remind people that, and really show people that, hey, we we're not asking you to come in perfect at no. all, because we're not perfect, and we've been here, <laughs> right. So you know, it's not it's not no need of us asking you to come in perfect, and we got to remember that, and remind as Christians, and not approach people in a in that uh, holier than thou, so to speak, condition. But you mentioned the phone call, and so we don't get there. We get there. Uh, Right now, I want to, because you, you, at some point you decided to end your life. You decided yes. to take your life. Yes, this is true. This is true. January 6, 2016. This is true. i never forget the day. Yes, this is true. I had some blackout curtains in my living room, 
And um, <clears throat> as of New Year, I decided that I wasn't going to open my curtains no more. So that was that. And um, you have to hit rock bottom. And everybody rock, everybody rock bottom is different. You know, everybody's rock bottom. Well, my rock bottom was I had um, holes in my shoes. And the bottom of my shoes, I didn't even notice it until I was going to the store one day. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, my shoes getting wet. I had brand new shoes, too. But I was depressed. I didn't care. I didn't want to put them on. It didn't make a difference. So, uh, <clears throat> so I reached rock bottom. And I started making phone calls. And I called my son and mother first. And um, then she called my mother. So my mother called me, and she was crying. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to do nothing. This, this was during the daytime. I was like, nah, I'm not going to do nothing. It's all right. It's all right. I'm not going to do nothing. But I knew I was. And so the day went on. And on my third trip, so I take three trips a day. So on the third trip, I said, okay, this is it. And I had some um, prescribed sleeping pills. Because when you lose uh, your vision, it's not. Yeah, tell us this. because this, oh, yeah. this is interesting. <laughs> It is not dark, people. It is light. Behind the glasses, it's bright. Out. It's very, very bright. It's very, very bright. It's like a white out. Mm. Okay. So when I close my eyes, it's not dark. It's white. It's that's, light. That's amazing to me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So my circadian rhythm had flipped, right? Mm -hmm. so, so my nighttime is morning to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it becomes morning for you, it's nighttime for me. So that's when I sleep. Okay. <clears throat> but it's still, I was in transition. I'm biologically a night owl anyway, right? So my transition was even harder because now I'm staying up all the time. So I got these sleeping pills. <clears throat> so I take, you're supposed to take them one at a time. I took two. Wasn't working. Not working fast enough. I took two more. Mm. And uh, I was listening to Anita Baker's Angel. I was listening to it over and over. So I started compiling a group text message. And it was one of those... Um, if you're reading this, it's too late type of text messages. Mm. So, uh, first time I looked at the clock, it was 3.52, and I started getting a little woozy. It's like, oh. So I had the door open. I left the door open uh, for two reasons. Well, one reason, because I guess I wanted somebody to come in and stop me, or save me or something. The second reason is, I wanted somebody to find me. It's things you never, Things you never think about. Right? You never think about, like, uh, like, how long am I going to be here before somebody finds me? You know, just those kind of things. So it's 3.52. I'm on my fourth, I'm on my fourth um, prescription pill, sleeping pill. And I um, start getting woozy. I look at the clock. It's 3.58. I start the song over. And um, I take a couple more drinks because I'm... Doing it with yeah, you mixing the alcohol. I'm mixing with alcohol pills. and sleeping pills. So you you really uh So I'm really trying to take you it that way. You got a cocktail that I, can take you out. This is true. This is true. This is very very true. And guess and what? That's what we are gonna do. We are gonna let them hear the rest of the story after <laughs> this break, y'all. We got a break. We, got, we I know y'all y'all anxious to hear. And we gonna let you hear, it, but we gonna hear it after this break, Pastor. We got a few more people that want to talk to you. And then we're gonna get right back to Demontes, cause this is the this is where we 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 about to we about to climax up the mountain right now. We right. about to hit the apex. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I just want to say thank you. Because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. I know you have prayed over me a lot and everything, and I really appreciate it. And with that being said, I just want to say thank you, and may God continue to bless you. Pastor, I just want to say I love and appreciate you, and Lady Fran, of course. And when I first came to the church, I was speaking a church where uh, the pastor and the body of believers were speaking after the will of God to know it and to do it. And you've done that over the years, and, and you just take us to deeper and deeper heights, or higher and higher heights in the Word, um, and you just really impacted us, and I don't know how my life would have been if I hadn't come to Kingdom, so I just really appreciate you and love you, and may you be greatly honored uh, in this season especially, we love you. One thing I admire about Pastor Brown is that uh, you can follow his example. He says what he says he does. And you got some other pastors out there in other churches. They say one thing in the pulpit 
and they do something else outside the pulpit that's contrary to what they say it is the pulpit. Uh, as far as I've been alive and been knowing and aware of my surroundings, uh, he's never really strayed outside of what he teaches. He's a real example setter. Doctor, apostle, pastor, father, brother, brother Brown. Oh my God, you feel so many hats in my life. I'm so grateful to be able to appreciate you this month. Um, I think about when Dad passed away and how you stepped in to be that father figure. So, father slash brother, I appreciate you so much, and I'm so glad to be a part of your ministry team. Keep going. You're the greatest. Hey, good morning, Dr. Brown. This is Minister Miles. Uh, just on the behalf of the Miles family, we want to thank you for all your 40 years in his body, 30 years of blessing me and my wife and my family. But um, thank you for all that you do. You're just a general uh, in the body and uh, in, in the kingdom and, and one of the best kingdom expanders we, we've ever seen in the body of Christ. So I want you to be encouraged today. Take it in today. Don't think of this as your reward because your reward is great in heaven. But we thank you for all that you do and appreciate you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Now, I know there could have been so many more people that chimed in, but frankly, these were the people that got me their videos in time. But you know what, Pastor? Just thank you, thank you, thank you for going to God on our behalf. That's really more than we can ask for. So, thank you. Love you again. As we said all night, thank you, Pastor. Thank, thank you, you, Pastor. We, uh, we do appreciate you, sir. And we just yes. really wanted to show you uh, just the number of people that, that had those words to say. But right back to it. I promise y'all. I told y'all <laughs> we were going to go right back to it. I'm, I'm not going to play with y'all. We're going to go right back to it. Okay. So you, you've taken these pills, uh -huh. mixed with this alcohol, uh -huh. and, and now it's 3 something in the morning and you're getting, you're getting that woozy feeling. Yeah. So, so I, I doze off. And my phone rang. But I'm in the, I don't know if I'm dreaming. I don't know if I could answer. I remember it very vividly. I was like, well, is, did you get a phone call when you died? Like, you didn't get a phone call. <laughs> you used a phone call from God. You used a phone call from God. So, so I didn't know how it really worked, right? So, <laughs> so I decided that I should answer the phone. So I answered the phone. And it was um, my friend from... California, so she was three hours behind me, and she called me to check in with me because she said, I know you've been going through some things, and I had this dream. As I'm in this dream, and it was this black cloud by your bed or something. I said, huh? And so I don't know how I sounded to her, but she called me by my government name, <laughs> called me DeMonte Diego Scott. She said, what is wrong with you? So I told her, because I felt real flighty. I felt like I was in a dream. Like, I didn't feel like this was a real thing. <clears throat> and I remember I kept looking at the phone anyway. So I told her what I did, and she said, um, she, said Throw those, she said, pour those pills out. I said, okay. So I pour them in the toilet. She said, flush the toilet. I flushed the toilet. She said, um, you have some water? And I had a case of water. I said, yeah. So she said, drink as much water as you can. So I'm sitting there, and I get to probably my third water, and I say, uh, you know, I can't drink no more water. And she said, well, I'm going to talk to you till you fall asleep. I said, okay. So she said, I'm a, so she started praying. She started saying prayers, and she said, I'm going to mm. pray for you and pray for you. She said, I'm going to call you in the morning uh, on, my way to, on my way to work. I said, okay. So she calls me in the morning, and uh, again, I'm still out of it. <clears throat> and so I answered the phone. And I remember the door was open, and I could see the sun, and it was just bright. And I was like, it was so bright. It was, like, very, very bright. And I was like, oh. And she said, uh, she asked me, how was I doing? And so I told her, she said, I told her that I had the lights and the curtains closed. And she said, Demonte, you can't live. She said, you can't live in the darkness. She said, you got to open those curtains. She said, open the curtains now. I said, okay. So I opened the curtains, and um, she prayed for me. And it was at that point in time where my mind switched. Well, after I got off the phone with her, my mind switched. Mm. And I, I went from saying, why me, right? Because at first it was, why me? Like, out of all the people in the world, why me? Um, and with that comes a lot of frustration and anger and, 
whatever feeling you can think, the confusion and not it's knowing which way to go. And yeah, it's an unanswerable question. It's, yeah, yeah. But I knew it had to be a purpose, so I said, well, instead of saying, why me, why not me? Mm. Why not me? If anybody can do this, I can do this. But at that point in time, I still thought I could do it by myself. Mm, okay. Right. So, so as much as I'm saying, why not me? I still hadn't let go of some of the things that was keeping me in that place. You, right. know, you understand what I'm saying? Right. And so, <clears throat> I called my mother in January. I don't know why I called her. Because <laughs> I called her in the middle of the day. And so, we was talking. And I hear somebody talking in the background. And I said, I call my mom Duke. I call my mom Dukes, by the way. I never call her my mother. I call her Dukes. So I said, Dukes, who is that? She said, oh, that's Alexandra. I said, oh, it's her. She said, what you mean? I said, it's her. I said, she can get me to do whatever I need to do. Never. She was like, you know her. I was like, no, I never met this woman. I didn't think I ever met her, right? So I said, can I talk to her? She said, yeah. So she put her on the phone and she got to talking to me and I got goosebumps. I've never heard an angel a day in my life, but to me that's what an angel sounded like. Just, I just, as soon as I heard her voice. See, I, I hear like you see. Matter of fact, I'm willing to, I probably hear better than you see. Mm. And with that being said, I hear things in people, voices. Your voice is like, it's your identification for me. Mm -hmm. So as the second I hear your voice, I can hear if you're bothered by something, like the, the, the things that most people don't pay attention to. So, um, <clears throat> so she got on the phone, she got telling me all these wonderful things the guy had in store for me. Mm. Okay, so I said, okay, I said, can I call you tomorrow? She said, yeah. So I called her tomorrow. One of the first things she said, she said, hi, Demonte, I said, hi. She said, what are you waiting for? I said, what do you mean? She said, what are you running from? I said, what do you mean, what am I running for? Because in my mind, <laughs> I'm not running from nothing <laughs> right. because I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with and there's no way nobody can say I'm running, right? She said, don't you know a guy has from you? I said, oh. She said, but you have to let go of your anger. I said, mm. oh. She said, what are you so angry for? I said, oh, you know I'm angry. So I got <laughs> mad at her for telling me that I was angry. Yeah, I'm not angry. I'm getting mad because you said, right. And then I had to, and she tell me, she said, just listen. Because, you know, I'm on the defense mode. I'm not angry. You angry. You, can't, you don't know me. You know, how you going to tell me I'm angry, right? And, and that was it. Right, so I had to sit back and I had to listen, which is the hard thing for me to do, right? Because I'm a talker, so you know most people who talk don't like don't like to listen, you know. Let that cat out the bag. Hmm. But um, so after I got off the phone with her, I took uh, I like to sit in silence, you know, so I have peace of mind. <clears throat> and I had to figure out why I was angry, because I felt I didn't even know I was angry because I felt like I felt like. I deserve to be that way. Mm. Understand? Yeah, and because if anybody did, if you anybody did, right? should be mad. I, right? I should be mad. And everybody should give me a hand for being mad and understand that, okay? And just deal with it, okay? Right. right. Let me just be the mad guy, okay? And, you know. But I cover it up with a nice smile, though. You know what the Holy Spirit revealed to me about anger? What's that? Some, some, a, couple, a few years ago, and I shared this with the teenagers, mm -hmm. but it's like a an aerosol can. You ever see the instructions on the aerosol can that say uh -huh. it, it, contents under pressure? Mm -hmm. it, it may burst. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's how we, we, if we hold on to anger, we, yes. can, we got those contents under pressure. Absolutely. Yeah. And see, the yes. thing about an aerosol can is that top, that when you hit that button, that's the release valve to release the pressure. Yeah. That's how it sprays. Yeah. And we have to release that pressure Absolutely. or we're going to burst. And that outburst might be against somebody that you love. Yes. You might take stuff out on them. Yes. It might be Mom Dukes. It might be yeah. anybody yeah, in was. your life. This is true. But Mom, how were you? Because how much? Of, how much of all of this did you know that he was going through? And, and you know what was going I, I, on? I, I knew. I, I knew he was in, in some real dark places and some real dark moments because he would reach out, and and whenever he would call me, no matter what time or day or night or whatever, if I had to step out of a meeting, I was taking the call. Mm. Because I knew, I, I knew him that well. And, but I also, I'm also a prayer. I'm like, doggone it, nope, 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 nope. Because in my mind, 
I'm like, uh-uh, you got to save some people because he has a way with the young adults. Oh, yeah. And he's had that all his life. And you, you know, he, we, we got a big family, and he didn't counsel many people in our family and pulled them back off the edge. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. See, you got something to do, and that's why you're being attacked. Mm -hmm. If you can make it through this, and I just had to hold on to that. But he knew, he knew enough to reach out, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. He knew enough. He had yeah. enough instilled in him yeah. to reach out. Absolutely. And to leave Absolutely. that door open and Absolutely. answer that phone eventually because mm -hmm. he, he really didn't want to die. No. Mm -hmm. and, you know, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did, but he didn't. Yeah. No. Right? yeah. You know, that right. combination of right. depression and alcohol and a lot of things led to that decision. But really, that spirit inside you was like, no, nah, I need, you know, I want to live. Because there's the something situation. more. Yeah. You know, you knew, mm -hmm. you knew it. But so tell me how you got the kingdom. Because I know, yeah. how did you end up getting the kingdom? <laughs> okay, so, so <clears throat> I had this conversation in January. And so um, I had tried everything. Man, I tried everything. It wasn't in the bottle. You can't roll it up. You can't take a pill for it. I tried everything. When I say everything, I tried everything, right? So I was empty, running on fumes. And um, June came, and I was uh, back on Salvation Street, back on Carpenter Road, yeah, back to the scene of the crime, see? <laughs> when you go back to the scene of the crime, sometimes it just, it, you know, it's postpartum, I don't know what it is, what it, no, not postpartum, sorry, post-traumatic <laughs> post syndrome, PTSD. So I'm sitting in the parking lot, it's a whole bunch of people pulling up, they got adult beverages, spirits, whatever you want to call it, I don't indulge in any of those, by the way. So I'm sitting there, and I said, I can't do this no more. I said, I cannot do this no more. Uh, I felt my GPS going back off to my um, old rental properties and, um, you know, my beachfront property that mm -hmm. I had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, I was thinking, Mike. So I didn't want to vacation back there again. So I exit stage left where everybody I had to catch up with my crowd. See, that used to be my crowd. So my crowd had pulled up, and I thought that was my crowd. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't my crowd no more. So I exit stage left, and I called Dukes, and I said, Dukes, I, I need to go to church. It's a Friday. June 3rd is Friday. <clears throat> I said, I need to go to church uh, Sunday. She said, okay. I said, no, no, I'm for real. I need to go to church. She said, okay. Okay, okay, cool. Woke up Saturday morning. I called her again. I said, hey, Dukes, uh, I need to go to church tomorrow. She said, okay, I know I'm going to church. Said, okay. Now, and Sunday was her birthday. Um, June the 5th was her birthday. I called her again on her birthday. Uh, good morning. Did you say you was coming to get me? Right. You said you was coming to get me. <laughs> I need this, like I need this because I refuse to go back, you know, where I, where I came from. And um, man, I was nervous. I was excited. I was happy like I was going to school for the first day. I mean, I got my outfit out. I was, you know, I was ready. I was ready. So when I came in the doors, man, uh, I got hot. <laughs> got real, real hot, right? <laughs> so I got lightheaded. So I said, okay, let me sit down for a minute, gather myself, gather my thoughts. And uh, I just got the Water. And I said, well, maybe it's the air conditioning. You know, it's a little hot in here. You know, air conditioning. <laughs> Take my glasses off. Wait, mm -mm. Then I needed some tissue. And I got the tissue. Tissue wouldn't work. Put my glasses back on. Put my glasses back on. Maybe, you know, I don't want nobody to see me in my hat a little moment, right? <laughs> that wasn't working no more. So I got my shirt and got the wife and <laughs> my shirt. And that day, I would never forget, Pastor Star preaching about living in the darkness. Mm, and he said, mm, mm. didn't y'all have fun in the dark? I sure did. I said, oh, he's speaking my language. I was just about to have fun in the dark, and then I did. So I thought he was talking to me. So everybody was quiet, and I was, yes, sir. I, oh, he was, he was talking to me, talking good. I was getting goosebumps. I said, this man know me, or something, or he was spying on me, or something. I don't, he got the drop on me. I don't know how to say So it got good to me. I mean, it got real good to me. He got to talking about how uh, <clears throat> how people carry around attitudes, and they like uh, uh, Linus, um, you know, Linus from the Peanuts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how depression is. You carry it around with you, you know, you stinking up the joint everywhere you go. And he was talking about that. I said, he's talking about my life right now. <laughs> I said, well, huh. So, uh, when I was younger, I used to hear people talking about how they was high off God and high off, this, you know. Not to say that I've been high before, but you know, say so, so that I probably yeah, I tried things in my life. Man, when I got out of when I got out of church, I couldn't stop telling people about the feeling I had. Mm. I just couldn't. It, I had. I needed more, and I have an insatiable appetite. I had to 
after church was over, I had to make it a point, and I make it a point every single Sunday to thank him for his teachings. Now, see, I've heard you because of my position yeah. here um, as security. Mm -hmm. I've heard you interact with pastor, and, I, and I, 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 I told you on the phone, I didn't know what you said, but I heard pastor yeah. say, man, you don't know, you, you really made my day. And, I, and I, it, it caught me off guard because I know pastor deals and he interacts with so many different people um, in, in his position as pastor, but for, for, for him to, to say that you made my day, it let me know that what you said to him was probably, and, he, and you, you show your appreciation in those words to him to the point where he, I think, as a matter of fact, I think he prayed with you right after that, and mm -hmm. it was just, and I was just like, wow, you know, we don't understand sometimes, we take Pastor Brown for granted sometimes, right. us of us, those of us that get familiar with mm -hmm. him because we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't understand how somebody can come in and get that word and really grasp hold to it mm. and it make a difference in their life. Because Pastor is a, he's a real pastor. Like he, he ain't yeah. just a pastor in name only. He's a real pastor. And I looked up, because I know some people's like, well, what does it got to do with pastor appreciation? It's got everything to do with it. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Pastor, the kingdom pastor, in words in different life says, kingdom pastor is a present a present, like a gift, authorized to strengthen, train, order, and restore. Kingdom pastor is the voice of God offering vision, value, and victory as he watches over the souls God has assigned, developing them for the expansion and advancement of the kingdom of God. Pastor spends his days going to God for us. Yes. Yep. Watching over our souls as, he's assigned, as we've been assigned to him. His report card to God is our growth, our excellence, our prosperity. When we get an A, it's an A for him yes, sir. on his report card. And I said, you know, and, 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 and sometimes, like I said, I think we take it for granted. And that's why it's so important for us to come in as we, as we wrap up. It's, it's so important for us to be here and hear the word and to constantly build that faith. Because we can't build faith without hearing the word. That's, that's the Bible. The Bible says yeah. faith yeah. comes by hearing yeah. and hearing the word of God. So if you're not coming to hear it, because it also says, how can I hear without a preacher? Mm -hmm. So we got we, we to come in and hear it and be here because we don't know what word is going to have that impact that it had on you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with that being said, um, I like to say faith is it's like life. It's a journey. It's not a destination. Right. So I might have taken a, a longer path or route to get here, but I didn't take the wrong route. And, and, and when I got here, um, you know, they say real, recognize real. Yeah. <clears throat> to be amongst believers, but to see pastor, um, the eyes are the windows to the soul. I was introduced to pastor as a teenager, mm -hmm. as a teenager. Um, <clears throat> my mother been attending the church since it was on Kyle Road, Frank's Nursery. Okay. And I remember... I remember the first time I went, yeah. there was a lot of things going on, okay? There was some people running around with some flags and stuff. They were playing instruments. I said, well, you know what? They love them some God here. They love them some God here. Yeah. But the second the pastor started talking, he had me a hello. You know what they said? He had me a mm -hmm. hello. Mm -hmm. I said, oh. I said, he the truth. I remember his eyes because I have a visual bank, a visual memory bank. So I know how he looked. And he got a smile to light up the whole room. Mm -hmm. Light up the whole room. And, um, so when we got back in the car, Duke said, how do you like church? Now, mind you, I'm the person who don't go to church on no day to end, then why? <laughs> but I was raised in the church, though. Mind you, I right. was. I just made up my mind when I got old enough, I wasn't going no more. So, but that's neither here nor there. So she asked me how did I feel about the church. I said, you know, a lot going on, okay, a lot of going on. But the pastor is the truth. It's the truth. So, um, so, so you I'm, knew that even then from your first experience. Very first time I met him. And see, that's, and, first and, time and I met him. You know what? It says a lot. And it, it, what you're saying is such a, man, it's so powerful, Demonte, your, your testimony. You shared with me, you, like, you, said, you told me, I really walk by faith and not by sight. And that, when you said that, I said, man, that is the realest example <laughs> that I could ever think of. Because, yeah. because yeah. you had sight yes, physically, had, yeah. and mm -hmm. then you, you lost your physical sight. Yeah. So you had no choice but to walk by faith. faith but, you know, that's the hardest thing in the world to depend on other people to walk. Mm. Like, like, I just started, I just got a stick probably 
four or five years ago. I wouldn't do none of that. None, none of that. And I wouldn't put on no glasses. No, none of that. N this, none, none of that. I did none. No. Um, because I felt no like it was up. a. No, nothing. I, I felt like it was a. I don't know, it was a uniform I didn't want to put on. I don't put that uniform on, right? And I literally walked by faith, not by sight. Mm. Speaking of uniform, as we close, because I told y'all we weren't going to talk for hours. Like we could, we could keep going. I got so much more. We definitely are not finished. Right. Uh, we are. We already talked. We gonna get to get. We gonna definitely do more together. But speaking of uniform, y'all see, we got our shirts on. Our kingdom mm -hmm. is taking over. <laughs> I heard you tell Pastor this was your uniform, and I yes. never forgot that. Yes. I said every time yes. I wear this shirt, I'm gonna think yes. about this is my uniform. I'm going to work, yes. or I'm going to the to the to the game where I'm yes. gonna put on my best performance yes. when I put this uniform yes. on. Yeah. And so, man, your testimony is such, it was one of grace, man. And I, I appreciate yeah, thank you. everything, man. I, I appreciate you sharing, being open. Thank you. Um, I really do. And I want to just say to everybody, we, we understand a couple of things. We understand depression is real. Mm -hmm. We understand anxiety is real. We understand that thoughts of suicide are real. Yes, yes. But the word is more real. Yes. And God is more powerful than them all. Yes. And we just want to make sure we understand that. Now, if you are in a suicide crisis, um, you can call 988 from your phone. Um, that's the new suicide crisis hotline. You can also text the word TALK to 741741. And you can call Kingdom of Heaven Ministries at 810-732-5880. We have resources available that will help you uh, naturally and spiritually. And that's what you need to get out of that suicide crisis is you need a natural help and spiritual help, and we can provide that for you if you give us a chance. So, again, thank you both. Thank you both for coming. We just want to pray. Let's pray, y'all. Father, we thank you. We thank you for just being who you are. First of all, we thank you for our grace gift that you blessed us with as we appreciate him today. We, we thank you for all of those who heard this message, who will hear it moving forward, who will hear this testimony and wonder how, they sell, how themselves can come out of that situation that they're in. Well, Father, show them the path to the kingdom. Show them the path to you, Father. That's the way. That Let their, their loved ones know, their friends will know. It. Help them guide them to you and help us inside the kingdom go out and reach them. Go out and bring them in and let them know, hey, we love you. We have an answer for you that you cannot find outside of the kingdom. So, Everybody under the sound of my voice, I just pray the blessing of the God, God over your life. I pray your understanding of this situation that we're not glorifying depression. We're acknowledging it and we stumping on his head with the word of God. Yes. Yes, sir. If you need help in any way, shape or form with that, please contact us and we'll be there to pray with you and help you through it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Now, Amen. if you want to sow into this, this great ministry, we have several ways you can do that. Um, electronically, you can go to www.itk2.com. That's our website. You click on Give, and you'll follow the instructions there. We also can give through Givelify app. Um, you can get that on your Android phone or iPhone. Doesn't matter. Download the Givelify app. Search for Kingdom Heaven Ministries. We're the one with the, the shield and the swords. And you'll see our Grace Gift and his wife on, the, on that page. Go ahead and, and uh, allocate your resources there. And obviously, if you're in the building or if you're in the vicinity, I should say, you can come bring it to the building. We have a slot on the north side of the building. You can drop it in. And if you want to give directly to the man of God, to our Grace Gift, to the one that we appreciate all month, you can do so through Cash App. You can download that app, and his Cash App is dollar sign LWB66. If you want to do that, definitely do that. But I got to ask one more thing before we go. Okay. Like, share, and comment on this video because this one, I'm telling you, is going to change lives. Amen. Until Amen. we meet again, y'all, we'll be here Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. God bless you. We love you. Peace. Amen. <clears throat>